Hello and good evening um, and welcome to our last talk in a series elephant in the room exploring the future of museums. Uh, last month talk was supposed to be our last, truly last of the program which began in uh, October by due to ingenuity of Professor Ellery Fouch who invited today's speaker Latanya Autry. Today's talk is truly the last talk in the series and a great capstone to the program. My name is Eva Garcelon Hart and the Elephant in the Room series, lecture series was organized by the Stuart Swift Research Center uh, at the Henry Sheldon Museum in Middlebury, where I work. Uh, we broadcast this program from Dakina, the ancestral homeland of the Abenaki peoples now known as Vermont. Uh, the Elephant in the Room lecture series is generously sponsored by a grant from Vermont Humanities, as well as private and corporate contributions. Uh, today's talk uh, also received additional support from the Middlebury College Department of American Studies and the Committee on the Arts. The program, although the program is free and open to everybody, we very much appreciate any donation you may uh, wish to uh, contribute to, towards our future programs like today's. Um, and since this is our last talk in a series, I wanted to thank Taylor Rossini for all her wonderful work on this project and also for her uh, great uh, creative companionship she always offers to me. So thank you, Taylor. Uh, tonight's event is held in conjunction with the Middlebury College American Studies course, Viewer Discretion Advice, Controversies in American Art and Museums, 1876 to present. The course is taught by Professor uh, Ellery Fouch, and she has invited today all her students. Uh, so, uh, and later on, she and Taylor will moderate the discussion, the Q&A, which you may want to either type, or I think there will be opportunity to raise your hand. So priority will be given to students, but we hope that all the questions will be answered, uh, you know, to your satisfaction. Uh, so, uh, last comment, all our talks were recorded and you can access them uh, through our museum website. So today, finally, today's our, our speaker is Latanya S. Otri, who is a cultural organizer and independent curator. She has exercised her liberatory curatorial praxis through developing exhibitions and programming in institutional spaces, such as Yale University Art Gallery, MOCA Cleveland, Art Space New Haven, and non-institution collaborative uh, freedom projects, including Social Justice and Museum Resource List, The Art of Black Descent, Museums Are Not Neutral, and the Black Liberation Center. Uh, she is completing her PhD in art history at the University of Delaware. Her dissertation is entitled The Crossroads of Commemora Commemoration, Lynching Landscapes in America, in which she concentrates on the interplay of race, representation, memory, and public space. Thank you for your attention and thank you for coming to this talk. And I will pass my voice to Latanya now. Thank you. Thank you for that um, very warm welcome. It is great to be with all of you here tonight. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Fouch for this opportunity to speak with the Middlebury community and the Henry Sheldon Museum communities as well as everyone else who is joining us. So tonight I'm speaking with you from the, through these digital technologies, right? Um, from the unceded ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee people in the area known at the moment as Cleveland, Ohio. And, you know, I do wanna kind of address the moment as, as much as I'm trying to address somewhat of a position or a location. I wanna think about these times that we're, we're in because they're, um, they're extremely wild times. 
And, you know, I do sometimes I sit at my dining table. I think I was just doing this a couple of days ago and I close my eyes and I hold my head and I just wonder, you know, what, what needs to happen and what can I do and how can I make my work, whatever I do that I'm producing, how can I make that um, be something that can bring about changes in an active way, you know, real changes. And how can I stop or at least try to limit co-optation? So I'm gonna try to talk about these things and also think about who I can conspire with. Cause you know, I, it, it feels often very daunting because these the problems are immense structural issues. And as an individual, it's like, what, what can I do as a one person? Um, but also I always try to you know, remind myself that you don't do this by yourself. You do this with other people. We have to find people to work with and find the people who are already thinking of, the, thinking of these issues and try to work with them. So I wanna kind of try to get into that um, a little bit in this presentation because these questions, they really aren't new. I know that they're not really new for many of us. Um, they're not new for me. And I do want to also say like my own kind of background, I come from a black working class background. Uh, my father worked on the shop floor in car factories in Detroit, Michigan, and later was a sergeant in the US Army. And I grew up witnessing family members and friends that really were experiencing um, labor, educational, housing, health, food disparities in kind of various, in various ways. And they were trying to address these things. And that upbringing in itself really made me have a strong interest in social and in racial justice um, work um, efforts. And so when I, I wanted to kind of put that out there because it helps, I hope to frame like what I do and why I'm so committed to it um, because it's really where I come from. It's, it's my background and I, I'm going to just do this because this is what I believe in. So if I fast forward to these times, you know, I'm also an art historian, which seems it's extremely different than that upbringing that I um, just mentioned to you. And I do study art objects, but I also study museums. And I wanted to clarify that because I think people often don't get it, you know, because a lot of times that what they, how they think about um, not just art history, but really like curatorial work is working in a museum as a curator, they're like, well, you work with these objects and you stu study that. And I'm like, I do, but I actually study um, the museum itself, its processes, how it, how it operates. And when I came in, I actually had this focus on studying how race operates through institutions. So this is already my focus. And a lot of people have told me that they, you know, they were kind of saying that they think of what I do as curatorial activism. And I, you know, really didn't get involved with what people consider curatorial activism because I thought it was like a fun hobby or it was cool or something like that. I got involved with speaking up and refusing domination and looking for other ways to operate, to exist, to work because it was necessary. It was necessary for my life. It was necessary for the people that I'm in my communities that I'm trying to bring into the institution and want to be in relationship with for me to feel like I was doing um, the work correctly and honestly and truthfully, um, truth, truthfully, I needed to kind of refuse a lot of things that I was saying. In the last year or so, I've witnessed what I would call a lot of um, people kind of basically just doubling down on very exclusionary and tokenizing practices in hegemonic institutions. And I've seen people basically ignore and discount claims for a deep transformational structural um, change. And a lot of this stuff, people think it's kind of a new thing in the last couple of years, there's been all of this activism. It's not, it's actually always been going on um, throughout for decades, you know, forever. And if you know the history of these museums, um, history of museums, they've been going on from the beginning, but especially like in the late sixties and seventies, there were a lot of artists that would be out on the streets and they'd be carrying, you know, signs literally and in conversation with curators and directors and, you know, other people about how things are being displayed in institutions, who was being excluded, how they were being represented. Um, so it's, there's a long history and there's books and everything that people have written about this. So the things that are 
going on, the activism in the last couple of years is really out, or a couple of years, few years, is really coming from a tradition, a long tradition. And the repressive actions have a long tradition as well. And many people have just kind of in these, like lately been just stepping up, stepping up the repression. And I see that as kind of connected to what's happening in general in the US right now with book banning and increased censoring of history. There's you know, outright gender discrimination and a lot more. So you know, these forces do not let up. And I find that this fight is happening throughout society. And yet so many people will claim that they are, as individuals, they're neutral, that our institutions are neutral that museums are neutral. You know, this is a, a constant claim. Um, I would like to share my screen. Stop here. Oops, how did I do that? Okay, now we're on the right spot. So um, I hope you admire this sledgehammer. I actually spent a lot of time looking up sledgehammer icons. Um, I'd like to one day draw, I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna work on that. I'm gonna try to draw an image of me as a cartoon figure with a sledgehammer. I just kind of love this image. Shattering the myth of neutrality. Um, it's a big deal, it's a big deal. Um, like I said, there are people that go around claiming that museums are not, museums are neutral and this is why I was just I was fed up with it after hearing that for years and um, I'll talk about this this whole initiative with the museums are not neutral uh, you know we, where we push back at that claim and in my own mind I love to think about a sledgehammer so that's that's why that image is in here today um, I think about my work I try to think of with with uh, think about it as praxis and some of you might know the work of Paulo Freire, who he was a Brazilian educational scholar um, who really did work in community. He wasn't only working in the academy, he worked in community. And in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, this is a really important book, like really pretty much everything he writes is great. You should read it, but this is a good one to, to maybe start off with if you haven't come across his work yet. Um, as someone, as for me, as someone who's creating exhibitions and programming, I've been trying to think about that work as liberatory curatorial praxis. This is a lot of, you know, words and it can sound like a bit daunting, like why you have all these words stuck together. And you heard that in my in the introduction. Um, so by liberatory, I'm talking about this kind of, this work of working towards freedom and, you know, curatorial work as well, we can talk about what curatorial work is in itself. It's um, a lot of things, but in general, just saying, thinking about uh, working with objects and collections and creating exhibitions and programming and writing texts um, that would be on view in the museum, publications, things like that. Um, and with this word praxis. So praxis, you know, when I first came across it, I didn't know what that word meant. I saw it and thought it was just a fancy word for practice or something. And you know, entering grad school, it's like, gosh, you always have all these words that just are confusing. And I think people sometimes see, see stuff like this and they get turned off right away. Well, it's not actually um, the same thing as, as practice. It's a specific thing. And it's kind of great when you learn about it. So in this book, he talks about, Freer talks about praxis in uh, really detailed ways that I, I appreciate it. And I come back to his work again and again. This is a book that I actually should reread because I read this several years ago and I'm sure I get more out of it now. Um, but you know, I would look up this word in a dictionary and it did not really say much to me. I didn't, it still didn't understand it. But when I came across Paulo Freire's discussion of praxis in his book, Pedagogy of the Press, I was like, oh, that's what they're talking about. That's what, what, what this means. It's basically working in a way where you reflect but you also have action going on at the same time. They always have to work in tandem. And there's a goal. It's not just to do a job or something. The goal is to transform the world, to transform structures, to make real concrete changes towards freedom. That's praxis. So most people aren't trying to do that when they talk about what their practice is. Practice is one thing, but praxis is this, it's always both of these things happen or three things happening 
together. And it's like, you're always in this constant critical kind of reflective process. So I am as a curator trying to do this, trying to use these kind of principles that I learned here and apply it to the work as a curator. And for me, it's about trying to change structures to bring, a, to bring about material effects and to really try to care about not just objects you know, and collections, but to actually care about people and communities. And that's a bit different. That's often not what people talk about when you get training to be a curator. Throughout this talk, I hope to um, try to focus our attention on the meanings of things and like the meanings uh, terms that I'm using. And I'm really gonna be spending time on this because I feel that often this doesn't happen. And I know I've made a lot of assumptions about what other people mean or assuming that people understand what I mean. And then later I've been very disappointed going, oh, this is not what I thought this was. So I'm, I'm trying to slow us down and have us actually think about um, the definitions and meanings of things. And here I'm thinking also with Bell Hooks. Um, some of you might've read her book, All About Love. And in there she says, definitions are vital starting points for the imagination. What we cannot imagine what we cannot imagine cannot come into being. A good definition marks our starting point and lets us know where we want to end up. Okay, so we have to know what we're talking about and we have to be on the same page if we're having a conversation so that we can work towards where we wanna end up. So I'm gonna just keep saying this, museums are not neutral at all. Okay, I'm just gonna like underline that over and over. Not at, at all, it's not, if they don't do this, if they don't, if they do this, then they can be, or they should be, or they were at some point. They're just not. They're 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 inventions. They're things that people made. Um, some people might know. I think a lot with different people that I read, and I really do try to think with the stuff that you know I come across in scholarship, and then apply it. So I will also be referring to a bunch of different scholars and also just, you know, to think with them and also to introduce them. If you don't know these people, you should know them. I didn't know about this person, um, Michelle Rolf Triol. I, I think I had heard of this book, Silencing the Past, Power in the Production of History, but I didn't read it actually, even through grad school. Um, but because I kept seeing people referring to it in some other books, you know, that I was reading, it was like people kept citing this person. So I finally got this book and read it and was like, uh, I keep finding things where I'm like, I should have read this forever ago. Um, we should know this. In, in this book, in the very beginning pages, he says, we are never as steeped in history as when we pretend not to be. But if we stop pretending, we may gain in understanding what we lose in false innocence. Naivete is often an excuse for those who exercise power. Okay, I'm really stressing this part because this um, claim that museums are neutral or should be neutral, can be neutral, whatever, it is actually dominant um, in hegemonic institutions. And what I mean by hegemonic, I mean these institutions that are, especially these big places, these encyclopedic museums, they have a lot of money, these big endowments and stuff like that, often in collections from all over the world. A lot of the people in leading positions in those institutions make a claim that the museum is neutral. And you know, when I went into these museums, I was like, what are you even talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, if someone <laughs> already had like a, a, or studying for a master's and then working on a PhD and then meeting people who also have advanced degrees and they're going around saying the museum is neutral. And I'm like, the whole thing about what, where a museum gets, um, how, they, how the construct came about is not a neutral thing. It's very much a um, part of a, a politic, right? It's, let me get back to my notes here. Um, jump ahead. So they have these imperialist roots and it's not just in like, so that happened a long time ago in the past where these things were uh, collected or looted or however the things got taken away from the countries. Um, where they came from and then end up in these like cabinets of curiosity that later end up becoming like what we know of as a museum today. Um, it's not just that those roots are that, it's uh, the ongoing practices over hundreds of years. And like right now today, they have imperialist kind of um, practices and colonialist practices. There's a lot of exclusion. I'm gonna get into talking about more of this. Museum comes about at the same time 
as basically as imperialism is happening. So like go fi 500 years ago, when white supremacy is kind of really setting up and becoming an ideology, when the carceral um, becomes about the prison system, when capitalism is really kind of moving forward, when chattel slavery is, all of this is happening at the same time in museums. And museums are part of this kind of complex, this system. So they are in no way neutral or outside of that. They come about at the same time um, when all, all of this is happening. So I just kind of was like, I, I really was surprised when I first started hearing people saying this when I was working in, in these museums. And I was like, are they serious? Is that a joke? And then I realized, oh, they just say that whenever they don't want to do something, usually um, things that I would um, suggest we do for programs. They would, oh, we have to be, you know, um, that sounds political, Latanya. We have to be neutral. And I was like, working at a place that's um, just right now, you know, like just to talk about the, the specifics is that I'm, I was at places for years where I was the only black person, only person of color in majority black cities and in the meetings, you know, for these museums, I would be by myself, like as the only person who's not white in the meetings for years. And the same people would tell me who also in the meeting that the museum was neutral, that this is the neutral um, experience or something. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's not. This is just a power move and this is a myth. And it wasn't just that, you know, a particular institution I was at, it's happening across the field where people just constantly have this thing that they just say when they don't want things to happen or they want to hide um, a lot of a lot of uh, the real issues around money, like the funding, how they get the money they have. It's none of this is neutral. And I was like, OK, so, yeah, I was, I was getting really fed up with this. Um, so, you know, I, I want to kind of also say that when I started in museums, and a starting studying art. I actually have always liked art and I pretty much have enjoyed most of my time studying art history. Um, and I also had a lot of great experiences in museums. I was a person who grew up going to museums, um, even though I come from that kind of, you know, background of uh, working class background, my mom and I, we would take a bus into Detroit and we lived in a little town nearby and we would go um, to the Detroit Institute of Art. That was the first museum I went to. And I really loved it. I went to museums since I was six years old. But at the same time, I also understood, you know, early on and later really understanding that these are very complex places and, you know, didn't really feel like they was really for me exactly and felt very exclusionary. And I knew that. Um, so it wasn't like I, I could not actually understand that these two things are happening at once or more than two things really. So in museums, I've had some really great experiences with various individual staff and especially with visitors. But I've also kind of witnessed there's often been like when you have a migraine, if you get migraines, you know what this is, like a low intensity kind of migraine. That's what I would feel a lot of times in the museum. There would be this kind of seething culture and with especially certain people, but sometimes often at the top in general, there's just this kind of hostility, especially directed towards poor people. Um, towards black people in general, there's a lot of anti-blackness, indigenous people. I've heard people just say outrageous, sometimes overtly racist comments and stuff. Uh, Latinx people with the working class residents in the areas that are surrounding the museum where they just don't really want these people to come here. And I found that people in key positions, they work really hard to maintain a racist kind of exclusionary kind of atmosphere. And, and then what, what happens is that creates a real sense um, of fear. And that's the thing that I did not expect when I went into museums and start really working in there for longer than three months. Like when you go in there for these little internships and stuff, you really can't understand what's going on. You have to be there at least a year, two years to really understand and see the, the mechanics of it all. Um, and that's when I started to go, oh, and then realizing where this hostility is and then noting that other people realize it too. So then it, it shapes how they behave at this place, even while in another situation, in a, you know, another, another location conversation, they may talk to you in a certain kind of way, but when they get in the institution, people like clam up and they will not speak out when they see things that are um, wrong. So there are various things that are not neutral. I was gonna put a slide in here, but I didn't get to it. Um, the, the, a lot of what happens in museums is there is just a ranking of cultures in general. There's like a hierarchy. You can even see it in a lot of times in the, the architecture, the layout, 
in terms of like where things are located in the institution. June Jordan is this black poet that many years ago in the seventies, um, she said something, she was talking about the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And she talked about, um, uh, well, she is a, a word that I'm not gonna say, but the M word. And she talked about how they would make a special little room where they would put all the art of like black, black art, African art, um, African-American art in this one area, like in the basement. And she was like, this is ridiculous. You know, it's not, this is not a, um, a reflection of our culture and the fact that we're like located in this little place down in the basement. People have talked about the, this kind of hierarchy and how you see it in institutions where like art of um, Africa or oceanic art or something like that is all like downstairs in the lower level. And then as you move up higher and higher um, and you get to the top floors, there's like American and then European art. That's like how the Met is generally <laughs> kind of laid out. Um, and I'm only laughing because it just seems so outrageous, but it, it's what it is. So there's this ranking of cultures. There's how they get the art in the first place, the source. Um, there's looting, you know, that had happened. It wasn't the people at the museum, but other people, you know, and they bring it and then it comes in the museum. And uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff that happens. Uh, cultural appropriation. There is a general, generally a, um, a centering around whiteness. And with that, even in terms of the employment, indigenous, black, Latinx, Asian people are rarely in leadership roles, even in cities where those populations are in the majority. It's just kind of regular. The funding is basically wealthy people control the museums. It's, it's just how the funding streams work. Um, funding is pretty much from philanthropy, um, individual donors with money and then corporations and then grants, foundations, and then a little bit of it comes from other people. But because most of it is concentrated in the hands of the wealthy, that is the people who really control the institutions. The museums tend to be very hierarchical. They actually follow a corporate structure where there's like a president or CEO, literally a CEO at the very top. And then it kind of, you know, spreads out and then there's the people at the very bottom who really do most of the work but don't really get paid much and don't have benefits and stuff. So that's really following, um, often don't have benefits. That's following kind of a corporate structure. And then they do this kind of predatory, um, what I, I consider it predatory and DEIA kind of methods or measures often operate kind of in a predatory way that are used in hiring and bringing in people for temporary kind of provisional roles and um, into environments that are really hostile towards them. And you kind of end up becoming exotic by while you're in there and you get kind of pulled out to be a, um, when they need you for like press material to say, we've got one. So yeah, when I was in those spaces, you know, I wasn't considering, like I said, this is not a hobby to resist all of that. That was actually just necessary to do for myself, for all of us who are kind of, unfortunately, regularly experience um, where you kind of experience being denigrated and pushed to margins and excluded. And some of you, I think, uh, probably, especially the students, hopefully do know about um, museums are not neutral. So this is a initiative that I started with Mike Morawski. And let's see, I guess I have, yeah, I have the ability. So this is Mike over here. Whoops, I went ahead. There you go. This is Mike here. That's me in the middle. Um, we started this in 2017, this initiative, and this really, for me, kind of came out of frustration after just constantly hearing people say that the museum is neutral whenever um, I was really trying to, to do programs and things at this very exclusionary institution. So I thought, you know, Mike and I kind of talked and we thought we would come up with this shirt. We're just like, I want to wear this across my heart. I'm just going to put it out there, the statement. I had no idea that this would really catch on. Um, so we thought we would do it for a few months and it would be over. This started in 2017 and it's still really going. Um, it caught on because a lot of other people really felt this frustration as well because they also are hearing it. As I said, it's dominant. It's not across in all institutions either, by the way. I have met people who work at Black museums who are like, I think that's great what you all are doing. Also, that's not even a thing for us. And I was like, that's great. I'm really glad it's not a thing. I should probably go work over there. Um, because those institutions, even the origin of them 
they started out of being excluded, like, you know, the histories and narratives, as I was saying how June Jordan, that poet was talking about the Met. A lot of times museums, they created these other institutions which get called ethnic museums. They created those out of a response to being constantly excluded or just having um, the narratives be really misshapen and how the, um, their culture is just not, you know, respected. So they've created these other things. So it comes out of a political, positionality that they acknowledge. They don't try to hide it. So this is about certain types of institutions. It's not all museums across the board. So um, that myth, you know, as I was saying, it, it is really much bolstered by lies. It's a way to kind of cover up a lot of the real just regular things, the origins and the ongoing stuff. And I like to think with um, philosopher Charles Mills, he talks about there, there being like this myth and not just about museum neutrality, he's thinking more generally about like how racism operates through the world. And he says how it's kind of founded on this um, epistemology of ignorance. And I was like, oh, I love that way. It's like epistemology is about this kind of how, how we, um, systems of knowledge and how there could be a system of knowledge that's actually based on ignorance. How people can always be like, well, I just didn't know. <laughs> you know, you can always kind of just go out and, you know, but they do, they know, but they can have this whole structure that allows them to operate that way by having um, this, this claim of ignorance. And, you know, obviously this myth is a way to disavow historical and social contexts. as it's really problematic, especially for an industry that goes around claiming to be educational. That's why I'm just like, you got to pick one, you know, like you can't claim, claim them all. Like, how are you actually you're actually disavowing your own history. Um, if we don't even talk about what they do right today, but your own history of institutions by claiming to be um, neutral. So yeah, it's problematic, but it's been great to see that the initiative is really caught on with people, not just in the States, it caught on with people like across the world. And that's the part that kind of surprised me. People throughout Europe, um, there's been people in Australia, South America, Japan, like all over that have really connected with, you know, highlighting and being like, we can speak up against um, that myth when, when it's projected towards us. Now, the, on the, um, I don't know, the right side of your screen, I guess you'll see a running thread. And, and that's basically from Twitter. That's from years ago. But it's conversations that people have using the hashtag. That's the part that really excited me too. So the the shirt, when we sell the shirts, um, they're online, but when people buy the shirt, the proceeds go towards um, community organizations. And I think that's really important work, especially because I was told how we can't do anything in support of um, other arts organizations in town. That's like stuff that I heard at these kind of hegemonic institutions. So we do work that actually does support other community organizations. And I love though that it's created this space where people have these discussions, you know, and they use the hashtag and then people all over the world are in dialogue. And that's, that's a really um, cool part. And it, it's a way to get people to feel empowered and not feel alone. Cause a lot of times you can feel quite alone in these institutions when you're facing um, these myths and, and just lies and really being silenced. Um, so like I said, there's, it was a lot of fear in institutions that I did not expect. And I saw people, and I, I feel like it just kind of hurts me too when I think about these, these moments when I've seen people be in fear and they basically negate their own education. They negate their selves as they go along with the power structures. And I've seen people, they're just uh, fear, too afraid to express kind of basic sociological and historical truths because they really do understand the ruling attitudes and the social mores of the institution. And I find that that basically produces a lack of criticality and it makes the museum a closed text. Umberto Eco, um, he talks about closed texts in his book called The Role of the Reader. This is from a long time ago, like in 1957. And he says that the closed text attempts to elicit a sort of obedient cooperation. But in reality, you can't make these things close. Um, you can't really control it. So by close, it's a way to um, try to create this self-contained world. Like you can create and control the story if people only look in this box and they don't look on the outside and see uh, the ties that are of course connecting to everything else. And then this is a way you can legitimize your own narrative. 
and you can ignore facts and knowledge. Um, that, and this unfortunately is what a lot of people do. And this is a way that for, for some, it helps them to maintain power, but it also it creates a huge problem. And I consider that an exercise in delusion and control. And I think our you know, campaign is important because it pushes against that. And there have been classes, conferences, articles, and discussions that have centered on museums are not neutral. And I think together we are able to kind of disable um, that myth. And I mean, at the same time, it's still being preached today. Like there's, I, I went on Twitter last night and I saw some people writing stuff, a, a guy who I, I did a screenshot, but I, I didn't put it in here. Um, a director of a museum in Britain who was just like, yes, the museum is neutral. And that's why people trust the museum because we're neutral. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. So it's ongoing. It doesn't end. You can say all this and it'd be thousands of people saying it and there's books out there. Um, and, you know, Laura Reykjavich has a book, which I didn't put the title in here, but it's called, um, oh, I can't remember the exact title, but it's a, a, a newer, newer book, maybe from last year it came out. And she talks about, you know, museums are not neutral in there and, and about the culture, so-called culture wars. And still people kind of keep, keep up with the same thing. Um, like I said, the initiative is caught on and it's people, like I said, all over the world, but this was really cool. I see that I misspelled, unfortunately, I'm sorry. I spelled Erica Huggins' name wrong. There should be, after a C, there should be a K there. I really apologize that, for that because she is this really important person. She was a um, Black Panther Party member, uh, really important artist, uh, poet, human rights activist. I had a chance to be on the phone with her one time a couple of years ago, and it was just, it was incredible. Here she is in conversation with Shakira Rifos, who's wearing our Museums Are Not Neutral shirt. I just saw this one day on um, Instagram, and I was like, oh my God, she's in Korea. Yeah. So um, was really, really taken with this. There is, like I was saying, you know, museums are in the world. They have issues just like all these other industries. And um, I guess in some ways it's kind of good and also sad for me to think about a lot of our colleagues are out there unionizing. I think it's great that they're out there really pushing, but it's also like sad that um, the conditions are really poor. A lot of times in museums, they require a lot of education, but the jobs really don't pay that much. And also a lot of, they require a lot of hours, do a lot of, sometimes a lot of unpaid labor. Um, so in, recent years, there's been a huge surge in museum workers organizing and start in labor organizing. Um, Philadelphia Museum of Art Union has been working really hard for years now, for a couple of years or so, and really pushing. This is in Philadelphia, of course, um, the front of the museum as well as the stairs that they're covering, as you see that all those people with the signs, they're covering those stairs where um, it's kind of, I don't know, famous, infamous, where supposedly, you know, in the movie Rocky, um, the character runs up those stairs and is kind of standing up there, you know, with his hands up kind of thing. So it's funny to think about uh, museum workers in this position with their, their arms up holding these signs demanding a fair contract. I think it's great that so many museum workers are organizing like this, but I also think it's, you know, it's, it's sad that they're in this position and also um, the, the management continues to refuse to really sometimes recognize the union. And so they just, they get the union and then still they're fighting to get the contract for like a year or two years that's going on. Also, it's been really, um, again, sad, but also kind of the good part about the people resisting. So early on in the pandemic, early in 2020, a lot of museum workers were laid off. Um, especially people who are in the, those, like I was saying, that whole pyramid thing, the people at the, the lower end, which tend to be the, the people who are the front of house workers that you see, the educators, um, the cleaning staff, the security staff, these kind of people that really are doing a very important work. They don't make much money and often not working, have, have part-time kind of contracts and they don't get, um, sometimes they don't get benefits. Well, those people got really hit really hard, especially at a lot of big institutions as well, not just small little places that just didn't have that much money, but some really big museums with large endowments ended up um, letting a go of a lot of those people. They either got furloughed or um, did they really just like fired them. And a group of museum workers, forming this group called the Museum Workers Speak Collective, 
start organizing a mutual aid campaign to um, raise money for museum workers who were hit by the pandemic. So that's important kind of resistance and um, organizing that's going on. And I think, you know, it's always really important to point out resistance because nobody is actually, no, not nobody. Some people are just taking it, sadly, and for all kinds of reasons. But uh, a lot of people are um, resisting in a variety of ways. So I try to point out some of those. Um, I wanted to talk about what's kind of been happening at Penn Museum. I know I'm going hard on Philadelphia these days, or at least in this talk. Um, but I just, because I, I know people at the Philadelphia Museum of Art doing that organizing, and I think that's important work. And maybe just because, you know, my program um, in Delaware is very close to Philadelphia. So these are places that I, I've been and been on these stomping grounds. Um, last year, it was really horrendous to find out about what was going on at Penn Museum. You know, this is a museum that I visited and did research there and stuff. And this is, um, you know, not an art museum. Most of my work is in art museums or history, um, but this is more like a natural history. But they have ex other types of exhibitions, a, a variety of things. So last year, um, the horrendous events that members of the MOVE organization, so MOVE is a, a, a Black liberation group that is in Philadelphia, has been based in Philadelphia. Um, so some of the things that they encountered with Penn Museum really kind of became under public scrutiny last summer, or no, last spring, actually about a year ago. Um, and some of you might remember that MOVE, the family's um, home and headquarters were literally bombed by the Philadelphia police in 1985, like literally bombed. So a helicopter um, dropped bombs on a house. And 11 people, including five children, were murdered. The city examiner who had the remains, um, he gave the remains of two of the children, Delicia and Kerchicia, Tree is her nickname. Um, he gave their remains to a curator at Penn Museum for identification. But those remains, the actual remains were not returned to the family. And so for over 30 years, curators had the remains of those, those girls. In April 2021, 20, um, the family learned that their loved ones were being used as teaching tools in the museum. Like, really, you know, this is this is an important story and just you know facts that are going on. But this is something really important to pay attention to because this is where you see um, the museum, which this Penn Museum is connected to University of Pennsylvania, you know, it's an Ivy League institution. And you can see how the university, the museum, um, the police, the, the state, um, all working together. It, it's really like I was talking about how the museum coming about at the same time as the carceral and um, you know, uh, white supremacy and all that. These are all happening still in play in institutions. And you, know, you can read important articles about what's going on here with this travesty. And um, there's one that actually recently came out. I should have a little text box with the information, but this is in hyperallergic and it's from April 20th. And you can find this one because um, this is a year later and there's still questions about what's going on there. Um, I hope that you do read about this because it's very important. But here, what I wanna do is highlight that one aspect of this kind of inadequate um, and troubling response from the museum so the museum kind of issued an apology that was supposed to be for the family, but they first distributed it to the press instead of directly to the family members. And I watched the MOVE family, they had a press conference and I, I watched that and the family got the, the notice of the apology from a reporter who was reading it to them. Like the, it's, it's, it's so callous, like it's insane. Um, and I find it really disturbing and I, I see that some scholars and community members have protested and really continue to protest. There's more people this year too pushing still um, because we still don't know where one of the, one of the children are not really sure where her remains are. And yet, you know, I think this is what some people are pushing for is so important, but I don't see actually that much of a critical response from people in museums. There've been some people organizing, but not nearly as much as one would think would be um, happening. And I have some, let me see if I have that. Yeah, this is, um, 
I have a, some comments here from last year. This is from uh, a news report that I saw. So Mark Lamont Hill, he was in conversation with Dr. Crystal Strong, who is a professor at University of Pennsylvania in um, education, I believe, in anthropology. So she's an anthropologist and, and works in education as well. So he asked, you know, thinking about what what's going on at <laughs> this case at Penn Museum. He's like, can these instances push us to reimagine the role of the discipline of anthropology, role of the university in, in, in reinforcing this? And it's Mike Africa. So Mike Africa is um, one of the children who um, has grown up to be a man and he's, he's doing a lot of organizing um, to fight what's going on. He says, as Mike Africa said, these are children. These are people, you know, someone loved them. And this response from Crystal Strong is the thing like I really want us to think about. She says, I think it more than prompts us to reimagine. It requires us to reimagine. If the foundation of scientific knowledge is an extension of state violence, the abuse of black and brown and poor and indigenous bodies, indigenous people, then that means police are not the only thing we need to abolish. Perhaps we need to abolish scientific knowledge as we know it. That we need to think about what kind of university must exist, if it must exist. What kind of knowledge must exist in order for us to, number one, as MOVE has taught us to see life as a priority, to see respect as a priority, to see an ethical praxis as a priority. So to bring it back to the beginning, it requires, there's a moral and ethical and political imperative to fundamentally rethink and transform the university itself. That is a lot. And I have returned to her words again and again, because I think it's so important. And this is the kind of stuff I think about with the museum itself. Like the fact that this could happen for decades and you know, really it's always happening. So the thing with the pen thing, um, I think it's shocked some of us because it's 1985 and that's really not that long ago. But the reality is this has always been happening, you know, for hundreds of years to poor people, to black folks, um, to indigenous people, they have their bodies, they have their people in these institutions. And some people have been fighting forever, like the case in, you know, in Paris, um, the woman Sarchi Bartman was this African, um, South African woman. And this is a way back um, 19th century. And she was taken to France and they had her when she died. They, people put her on exhibit. It's just like a horrible story. They put her on exhibit when she was alive. And after she, after she died, they continued to put this woman on exhibit, her remains. And she was in some museum for like a hundred years or something, over a hundred years. She was on exhibit like at the Musee, Musee Le Homme, Museum of Man, and I think in Paris, um, I think it was for like 160 years, so crazy. And um, in South Africa, the, the government kept like asking France to give her remains back and they would refuse and refuse and refuse. They finally gave her body back and like after just decades of, of um, you know, these requests, like in 2007 or something or 2003, it, it's kind of not, not too far, um, not too long ago. So these things are not, again, this is not just way in the past. And even because they're in the past doesn't make it okay or something. It's extremely violent. And it's really upsetting to me that um, not enough of us, I think are really organizing, pushing against it. And I realize it can be hard to stop because stop and really pay attention because we're going through a lot of stuff all at once. So there's unfortunately a lot of um, horrific things that are happening in our society. So it's very heavy and I don't think a flimsy statement posted on a website is <laughs> adequate. Um, and then you just kind of go along business as usual. We really have to be doing something differently. And I think what we, you know, thinking with Crystal Strong's words there, we need to be doing things that are life aff affirming. Um, and also thinking with Christina Sharp, so she's this important scholar of slavery. And she talks about, she uses this expression in one of her books called In the Wake on um, Blackness and Being. In her book, she talks about those of us who care. I, I really like that expression and it makes us again, slow down because it's when we use we, you know, I, I use we quite a bit, but who is the we here really? It's gotta be those of us who care. And we really need to realize not everybody actually cares. And it's important to realize that um, we, 
those of us who care need to get real about the gravity and complexity of the devastations um, that are being wrought when we are confronted with genocide and slavery, we might be able to compel some real and necessary actions if we, we keep that in the first part of our mind. Um, so I, you know, again, want, as I said, this is helping me to slow down. As I've been talking about um, change and all of these, again, with those words, what does that actually really mean? And um, as I said, I've made, had problems before assuming um, that I share an understanding with people and then I find out they have a very different understanding of things. I sometimes have assumed affinities and political goals with people and then realize, whoa, nope. Okay, that hurt. And I've had to try to slow down and try to unlearn that tendency to assume. So while for me, I've been committed to social and racial justice for most of my life, my understanding of change and what I want to see in the world and how, it, how we can try to bring, how I can try to bring it about with other people, it has actually changed significantly you know, over the years, but especially in the last um, several years, I've really been changing my own thoughts a, a lot. Um, I used to think about change being more reform centered, you know, we could fix these things. And I think a lot of us, you know, believe that. And sometimes I slip and I still do that because that's just been how I've been forever. <laughs> but more recently I'm starting to think, yeah, this is nothing. <laughs> Some of these things you cannot fix. And maybe it is like what Dr. Strong says here, we need to rethink the university. We really need to rethink some of these museums or you know, the whole, the whole construct, right? It's, it's fraught in a lot of ways. It's thing of what's going on at Penn. This something is really wrong. This isn't something you can just make a tweak to. I think what we see a lot of times are people doing measures that are additive. Like we'll add this thing over here. We have a committee and that committee now is in charge of da da da, the diversity committee. Um, and there's again, more token measures that are happening. You can have really great people that you bring on but you're not really getting to the core issue of the problem that is rooted in the core of the institution. It's not a problem that can be fixed over here. It's at, it's at the center. And so what happens a lot of times are people end up just getting tokenized. And the people who are usually, who are for real pressing for, for real transformative change, they do not get invited into those, um, those, even those little additive things that don't do much because the purpose is for them to not do much, for them, for them to just stay over there and for things to stay the same, for there to be stasis. Um, yeah, let me find my, where am I? So, when, I, when I'm talking about change, what I'm talking about is um, transformation. I use that word, but I, I don't, I also realize people may think um, bringing in the diversity committee is a transformation that we wanna see or bringing in more artists of color and letting them do an exhibition. And I'm like, yeah, we were already doing it. That's not what I mean. I think, you know, again, those people can do great work. That could be a great show. It could be an okay show. It could be a not a great show, but that's not, it's just, it's like not the issue. That's just a, um, like a red herring or something. That's what we get, but that's not what we are asking for. We're asking for the, the thing to, at, at its core, for something else to happen because a, a new thing to be created or something, take these resources and make something else inside out where the same people who created the conditions would not be the people who are in the positions of power. So right now we have the same people who created the problems, they stay in place. And um, so the system stays the same and then they just add you know, people in for an exhibition and give you a fellowship, you know, little things like that. That does not actually address the root issue. So it just is made to repeat itself over and over again. So all of this stuff is heavy. And I have to say, even working on this, some of the stuff I was reading when I, as I start putting together notes, I was like, oh, it just, it's kind of depressing. I have to say it's depressing. Um, but in my own work, I have tried to find ways to break with the systems that are violent as, as through what I can do as an individual, but collaborating with other people, some that I find in the institution where I'm at, and some I try to find in the community. It's very, very important, this is a strategy, don't get hung up on um, only working with the people that you're like, if they tell you, this is your team and this is the people you're supposed to work with, that's fine. Try to you know see who who they are and what they're about, but also think broadly. And like I've worked at a university museum. This is a great opportunity to work with other people at the university. To not just work with people in the in the museum, but to work with professors and students. It's a great way to do other things because usually people in the museum are very conservative. 
some are just outright hostile to things. You can work with other people. Um, think about your broader communities. Also think about other people who don't work at the university or if you're an academic institution, just people who are community leaders, just you know, all of that, just constantly networking and trying to find people to work with, a, a librarian in town, that kind of thing. So this is a show I did called Let Us March On, Leave Freelander and the Prayer of Pilgrimage. Really love this show. I thought it was important. It brings forward some um, civil rights photography from 1957 that had, had not been seen for like over 60 years. Um, so, and brings attention more to the civil rights um, demonstration and the prayer of pilgrimage, which there's not that much scholarship on, but it's important. So I love doing it, but in a lot of ways, I do consider it kind of a conventional show. I like, I loved it. You see, I brought in some books and stuff, but we did also get out into the um, city. And here I created a walking tour where I um, looked up histories of black resistance in New Haven. And there's a very rich history. And here you only see a few sites that are located just like close to the university. But the map actually, I had a, a map that expand the city. And this is actually a project I want to kind of go back to. I really love doing this. And I found that the tour, I ended up doing it three times, two, twice, I think, for the gallery, for um, Yale Art Gallery. But then I also did it for Art Space New Haven. They brought me on and I got to connect with um, more people in the summer working with students student um, teen artist in a program they had what was great about it too is a lot of people don't go to these museums you know they just they don't go to them for a variety of reasons but sometimes it's just they they see it as like there's so much baggage and a lot of bad history you know um and it's real i understand why they don't i mean you can hear just from what happened at, what's happening at the Penn museum um and it's happen already at so many you know places and so a lot of people are just suspicious of these places but they will go to the, they will go to some other things so I personally like to kind of um, do this work this out in public spaces and connect with people and yeah I just love doing a tour so this is um, one of the ways an intervention and one that I plan to kind of come back to and do more with this public history kind of project um, temporary spaces of joy and freedom this show I really loved and I thought I was starting to bring together my studies of black radical scholarship and decolonial scholarship. So I was already studying kind of black radical tradition, but in the last few years, I've been actually really digging in and learning more about decolonial um, studies. And it's been really opening my mind. This exhibition I created, it focuses on um, co-resistance between indigenous and black people fighting white supremacy. And I worked really with activist artists. And I also work more closely with community members here. And so for me, I actually think this is, so far my most favorite exhibition that I've done because I was really putting these things that I was reading in dialogue with how I'm operating. And I started writing differently, like how I write the exhibition text. And you know, we welcome everybody into the space, but I was centering these people who are often um, pushed out. And this is, you know, in Cleveland. Cleveland is one of these majority black cities that the institutions with the most money, like million, million dollar budgets and so forth um, have no, <laughs> No people like me in key positions or any any people of color in any key positions. So um, and it's been like that forever. So it's one of those hard places. And to do this work to push against that while you're in it, you know, it's it's hard to do. But I was I was figuring out how to do that in this in that um, exhibition. Social justice and museums resource list. This is kind of more in the beginning. I started this in 2015. I, you know, I don't think this is like a super radical project, but I think it's important just to be documenting um, what's out there. And I, and I did do it social justice and museums, not in museums, because I often don't find there is any social justice really happening in museums. <laughs> People say that a lot, but um, actual social justice is not just having themes, exhibitions that feature social issues. That, that is happening and that's happened before. But in the last 15 years or so, they start kind of claiming they're doing social justice. And I'm like, I wish if only you don't do social justice and have the same issue. It's just, it, again, it's the same thing, but the sleight of hand thing and the way the myth machine works and because of how press is controlled, like the mass media press, it's frightening how we 
many people just don't see what they're doing. So there's a, a lot of sleight of hand going on. Um, so at a point I wanted to highlight or, and try to expose that there is all this scholarship out there that people have been writing about these things and there's histories. It's through the um, Social Justice and Museums resource list, which is like over 60 pages long. It's a collaborative list. I didn't put all of these entries. I put a lot of them on here, but not all of them. And, um, you know, ask people to share like what they know. And this is a space that's been interesting because a lot of educators have been using this in their teaching. And I think that's great over the years. So for me, it's about just putting the information out there. Putting the information out there alone doesn't, you know, change the world or anything, but it's, it's a part of, um, you know, raising people's awareness and political literacy. It's a start. The Art of Black Descent is a program that I do that I, is really a kind of a pop-up exhibition and dialogue program. And I have done this um, and created this really in collaboration with my friend, artist and curator, um, Gabriella Spinningson. We started this when I was at Yale University Art Gallery. It was a program that we actually got a lot of pushback. They didn't want us to do it because they thought it was too political. It's just basically focusing on, there's been a history of Black people fighting um, racism in this country and fighting just, you know, to exist. And at that time, of course, we used a collection at Yale. And when we finally got the approval to do the program, it took about a year. I mean, it was it was like that. Um, we had a great response from, from people who came to the program. They loved it. And then I ended up doing it. We did it together with um, classes with several classes, like five or six classes. And then we started just doing it on our own. And I, neither of us are wealthy people. So we use our own collection and we have prints, a lot of prints, artist books, zines, um, some photography and other objects. And it really, you know, our humble budget still lends itself really well to this topic because protest art is often made, it's like posters and things like that. And it's art that is uh, really great work and it's also affordable. And so the people who um, come to the workshops often are excited because then they see how they, you know, they could be buying these things too and having them in their home. And they also, we, we do together is we imagine how we can create change in, in our own communities. And we encourage people to think about public space and how they could using art, how they can recreate public space. And it's been great. We do this at libraries and public schools. I really love the Art of Black Descent. It's probably my favorite project. And then more recently, I did a teach-in um, really highlighting how more care needs to be used in institutions in these kind of hegemonic institutions that you know want to, for, for whatever reasons, show images of black death and suffering, there should just be some kind of ethics about how you show those kind of images. A lot of times there is not much attention or knowledge, and yet there is a lot of important scholarship that people have done forever. Um, in this, in this teaching, we highlighted um, Miss Samaria Rice's words. So she's the mother of Tamir Rice, a 12 year old boy that was murdered in police by police here in Cleveland, Ohio in 2014. It was very important for me to actually try to, you know, to work with Miss Rice. And I was trying to be very careful with how I did that because to be respectful because she's gone through a lot. And unfortunately, um, you know, all these parents of people that have been being murdered, you have to kind of respect what they're going through. But at the same time, it's important to, you know, honor their voices and perspectives because that doesn't happen a lot of times in our institutions. We just, just move on and just, put pictures of their kids in um, the museum and not, you know, without even thinking about what that could mean and how they feel about that and what it means to um, do that in the first place. So these are just some names of scholars that are really just, this is a, a small list because it is just, it's just a few of the scholars I've been starting to read that have really propelled my thinking in the last um, couple of years or so. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight them here I, some of them are more, you know, recent scholars, like, or, you know, so the scholarship hasn't been out forever, like Dylan Rodriguez. I mean, he's always been cool, I'm sure. But um, some of these people are, have been, you know, have set this, set the standard, like Edward Said's um, kind of scholarship, from Franz Fanon, like his books from like the 50s or something. I never read these people in school. I came across their work and then started digging in and then I learned a lot more. So um, 
I thought I had another slide, but let me, I think it's coming after here. Okay, so this I wanted to highlight in conclusion, you know, when you think about it is daunting, like I said, like you can sit there again and be like, oh, all this stuff is happening. How am I going to um, do anything in what I do? And I still don't know for sure. Sometimes it, it doesn't feel like enough to only create a way of like an ethics of how to address um, anti-Black violence through art and institution when we're faced with stuff like people are being murdered. The real, the real issue seems to be like, how do we stop the killing? Um, and as a curator, what can I do about that? It, I think there are certain things I can do, you know, as a, as a person who lives here. Um, but as a curator, then I, I try to think about what I can do in this job, in addition to other things I need to do as, as a citizen, um, as a person. And sometimes the things that we do as curators, I'm not sure if this, that's enough, you know, and I, I still kind of questioning some of the stuff, but some of it is like, there, there are families that are hurting and they're asking for help. So I'm gonna try to do what I can do. So that's for sometimes what it is. And I, I might change my thoughts on some stuff a year later because the whole part, the whole issue, like I said, with praxis is this constant reflection and action where you have to kind of keep doing them. And an answer that you may have for one instance isn't necessarily the answer for another. This um, quote is something that I stay with a lot. This is from Audre Lorde, uh, who was a really important um, black, um, queer, uh, lesbian, um, poet, writer, human rights person, just all, all these things. And here she, this is where she's thinking actually about um, a case that had happened in 1973, again, with a child that was murdered. So it was a boy named Clifford Glover and he was murdered by the police in New York City. He was shot in the back by plainclothes police officer, Thomas Shea. And um, Audre Lorde wrote a poem where she doesn't mention the, the, the child's name, but she's reflecting on the case. The case went to court like in, eight, in 78, and um, then this, um, her poem came out called Power. And I just wanna read a little bit of the poem. She says, you know, the, the cop, the police officer who shot down a 10 year old in Queens stood over the boy with his cop shoes and childish blood. And a voice said, die you little mf -er. And there are tapes to prove it. At his trial, this police officer said in his own defense, I didn't know the sides nor anything else, only the color. And there are tapes to prove that too. Today, that 37 year old white man with thir 13 years of police forcing 13 years of police forcing was set free by 11 white men who said they were satisfied justice had been done. And one black woman who said, they convinced me, meaning they had dragged her four foot 10 black woman's frame over the hot coals of four centuries of white male approval until she let go. The first real power she ever had and lined her own womb with cement to make a graveyard for our children. So that's from her poem called Power. And every time I read that, I just, it hits me and it's just, you know, a part of it. But this part where she says, they convinced me. Um, I wanted to, you know, highlight that because like I said, working in spaces where there's a culture of silencing and intimidation and fear can make us do things that go against ourselves um, go against people we care and love. And I know what that's like. I mean, you know, this is one instance, a very extreme instance here, but there are extreme instances happening in museums today, right now, all the time. And sometimes a, a variety of things um, that can be problematic that aren't necessarily exactly with someone's body, but, you know, you know, it's wrong and you feel pressure to do it. It's happened to me. And I've done some things sometimes or later I was like, I, and I knew I didn't, I, I kept saying, I don't want to do it. And I told them, but they kept pressing me. And I've been that person sometimes who went along with something and I'm not proud of it, but I'm pointing it out because again, with praxis and just really 
coming back to you have to know who you're committed to and um yeah you have to make these commitments you have to you have to stick with that and sometimes you're going to probably make mistakes but we can kind of come back and we can try to get better for next time so these are just some kind of paths that i've been thinking about i was sharing this last week with some people about how we can refuse myths in museums and really throughout society, how we can try to create our life that's more grounded in careful reflective action. And it, I think we do this through questioning and really, you know, committing to critical thinking. We don't do that enough. Like it's the best thing that they talk about in the university. And, and I think we don't appreciate it enough. It's like the most important thing about being a critical thinker and to when something doesn't feel right and you feel the dissonance, it's for a reason. And stay in that space with the dissonance and be thinking about where is that, you know, what's happening here? What's going on? Is it, you know, is this something I just never been exposed to? Is this something that really goes against like the facts, like real facts? And why would somebody, you know, why is why is this a dominant um, approach or claim in this space? The slowing down is necessary for any kind of real change. I think often these places and museums are doing way too many projects. They got everybody running like in a rat wheel. I'm not talking about do this, do everything the same and add on this thing. No, you just have to, some stuff has got to go. You've got to take, take away things so that we could actually work in a reflective way and to work in a more ethical way. We have to educate ourselves. We have to develop a political uh, literacy, understand power. And that's what I mean when I say political literacy. Often I think we don't um, use that kind of framing in teaching, but we really need to understand power. Who's got it, what it is, how it happens, how it gets used, um, what kind of claims are made to, to hide, hide the power relationship develop relationships with people across institution, not just thinking in such a hierarchical way, but think in a lateral way, work again, like I said, outside the institution, break through and um, connect with people. And if you're at a university, other people in the university, but also in staff, I didn't mention staff, please. There are staff, not just faculty and students, there are staff. And then at city museums, of course, working with other people in the city and other organizations, um, just really making connections and showing up for people's events, not expecting them just to come to your stuff, but just show up and be there so you can connect with them. Change what you do, adjust. You're, um, if we're really doing praxis and real reflection, we're gonna realize this doesn't work or this doesn't work in this instance. Maybe that worked five years ago, it's not gonna work up here. We have to constantly be you know, like living organisms, not stuck in, in one way of working. We have to stop. We have to just refuse at times. Like, like I said, the stuff that I, some, one time when I, I really feel bad about that one thing I did, um, reaching out to a parent whose child had been murdered and um, some people at the museum wanted me to do this. And I, I felt like it was exploitative. I did it, yeah, the parent wrote me back and I'm very upset. Um, and, you know, I apologized. But I realized later that I should have just refused to do that. And maybe some other people at the museum would have done, done this. And it wouldn't have been good, but it wouldn't have been me. Um, more of us need to refuse to do things <laughs> that are exploitative. When we have to commit to self-care and collective care. So, you know, caring for ourselves and in, but not just being stuck there, but really caring. When I say collective care, I'm thinking about for all of our society, and that starts with thinking about those who are most harmed by the practices that already happened, that are happening, and creating conditions that address that and make it so that the problems um, are addressed in some way. If we can't alleviate or repair it, we can at least address it and stop the harm. And so thinking about those most harmed first in, in a way to create a um, dynamic that makes it better for all of us. So I think I talked a lot and I'd love to hear your thoughts um, as well and how you are shattering the myth of museum neutrality. Thank you. All right, thank you so, so much, LaTanya. Um, you know, listening to this talk, it, it really is striking me how important this assertion that museums are not neutral is for a, a small, kind of house museum like the Henry Sheldon Museum is because I think in many ways we, you know, at first glance were not beholden to huge funding and funders who whose money was made in exploitative ways. We're not, 
you know, it takes kind of a second glance to sort of get at how we and our museum and its collection are participating in this, as you say, very imperialist history of museums themselves. Um, and so I think introducing this conversation um, to a museum like ours is wonderful. Um, and I hope that folks who are associated with the Sheldon and trustees and other staff who are here um, are really taking this um, to heart. So um, because we have Ellery students here, um, we would love to take some student questions first, if there are any, um, and I can let Ellery jump in um, and moderate those. So Ellery, I'll spotlight you as well. Okay, thanks, Taylor. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think my students have the option of clicking the raised hand icon. Um, or you can type something in either the chat or the Q&A um, bubble. Um, but yeah, Latanya, thank you so much for this really important work you've been doing. Um, I had a question about, well, I'm, I'm wondering what your reaction or response and kind of thoughts about projects that try to imagine otherwise are and the role of subjectivity and imagination um, in museums. So I was, I've been thinking a little bit about how I kind of think of neutrality and objectivity as being aligned. And I was um, wondering about the, the recent role of kind of um, speculative imagination, speculative fiction in the museum and things like the Metropolitan Museum of Art Afrofuturist period room. Um, for example, and these kind of uh, fictional settings that in that very much imagine otherwise, um, and perhaps create this, um, but it's still a fictional world then in some reason in in some respects. And so, yeah, I was hoping to hear your thoughts and response about that kind of practice and whether that is. Um, the potential for a, a liberatory practice, or whether that reinscribes um, certain oppressive tactics, or yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I haven't seen that exhibition. I've heard about it, and I've heard good, mostly just I've only heard good things about it, and so I'm very curious um, to see it. But I've just kind of not been traveling much. I'm still in Ohio, um, and probably won't get to see that exhibition. But I think it is interesting, and I heard it's going on at the same time while downstairs in the antiquity area, they're doing some really problematic exhibition where they're contrasting like Egyptian mask with like like with these something weird that's going on um, with some kind of culture thing. Uh, Dan Hicks is the author of that British Museums. He talks about how problematic that show is compared to the other show that's upstairs with the um, speculative kind of focus. Um, you know, museums, and uh, again, talking, it's, you know, I appreciate that, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm saying doesn't apply across the board to all, all museums. It, it does in terms of the roots, the origins of institutions, but then it does change. And there's, you know, it's extremely, um, stratified there's all these different types of institutions right and different access to funds and things like that so that's why i highlighted there are these other organizations that kind of came out as a like a, a push against so yeah there's a lot of different types of institutions and then within them like even in these big hegemonic institutions like the met there are people doing all kinds of practices and some of them are really you know probably in some ways, if they don't outright say that they're working against the institution, they can be by how they are framed. And I've been in roles where I've been trying to do that, imagine the otherwise in the institution and do, do this other work, the imaginative work. Um, and sometimes that can be great, especially for viewers, like for, for people who come in and observers and experience it, the visitors. And sometimes you know other things out, like when you created it, and you see the other the flip side of, of the problems and the fact is though it doesn't really change the institution you know so it does important it can you know it, at best do important work for people coming in and for the artists you know if it's contemporary artists and just people who are experiencing this and getting um, introduced to other things and it can make important changes that can possibly change how they think in 10 years from now you know they run with that and that can be really great 
but again, like in terms of it, does it actually change the Met in any way? That show, you know, I doubt it. Um, and in work that I've done didn't really change the museum either because people will go, why are you change a museum? I'm like, no, I didn't. They're the same. If not, in some ways, kind of worse. <laughs> or, they, or they adopted some of the things that I said and did, but, you know, I don't get credit for it. And at the same time, a lot of repressive things are still happening. You know, James Baldwin talked about this in The Price of the Ticket. He's like, sometimes you get, there's um, something on in this hand, but in the other hand, they're holding on to that really, really tightly. And so you didn't really get this big change that you think you got or whatever. Um, of course, he says this in ways that sound a lot better than how I'm speaking, because he's a magnificent writer. Um, so I'm doing a disservice, but the general idea. So they're important, but it doesn't change the core. And um, I see, I actually wanted to address something here because I probably wasn't clear and I do want to um, be clear about that. Someone wrote in the chat about how I was saying that poor people don't appreciate the museum or folks of color. I didn't mean that exactly. I just said that I, I do know certain communities who do not, it's not that they don't appreciate it. They just, they don't see that as having anything to do with them. And it's not all poor people or all folks of color or anything. It's just, but I have met communities who are like, like even in my own family who would just be like, that's nice that you want to do that. Good luck to you, you know? And then I would go over there and do it and then come back and talk about the problems. And they're like, yeah, we knew that was going to happen. But they're like, you know, go out, have experiences and stuff. It's just that they don't put their value in that institution. They don't, or just this whole construct. They don't see it as that's where truth is. That's where our history is. It's in this thing. They keep it for themselves. And they, you can go over there and sometimes engage with certain things, but I think they have like a protective layer. And like I said, a lot of people won't even go. I have people in my family who are like, they'll show up for that public tour walking down the street and looking at things, but they will not go into that museum. And for reasons, and some of it, I sometimes would get annoyed because they wouldn't come to my exhibition, but then I'd be like, you know what? I get it. Because I feel like that and I work in there. It's actually a violent place. I get racially profiled in my own job. So why do my inviting these other people to come in here? Cause they're like, they already know that's gonna happen when they go into that space there. And so sometimes they have certain real, they have reasons for why they feel like that. And that's what I was trying to specify. Not that this all poor people or all folks of color don't, don't appreciate museums. So some people are very protective about the kind of experiences they are going to encounter. And I well, think- And if the museum, and if the museum isn't, um either representing or speaking to or including very overtly like they've been given a reason to come in like they are they've absorbed that message that um those communities have absorbed the the message of being unwelcome which right. is, i yeah. mean some places literally have you know guards they wear like looks like police uniforms they're not yeah. police they look like police some places actually do have police on you know on the grounds and stuff and they're very hostile to the communities where they're situated so yeah I mean I, I really met people when I was at Yale that um would just think that's really nice that you're doing that and they would never come to the things that I did yeah and I think yeah me. and I understand completely what you're saying too because with I think some museums there's a sense of if we do this one program then we've addressed it we fixed it, we've done our due diligence or our penance or what have you. And it's like, great, we've solved racism, moving on. Yeah, um, they're doing a checkbox approach. And now, now a big one is trans issues. And I'm like, this is it's so not respectful to like anybody to treat people like that. Like they literally like, well, we need a trans show. I, this is, you know, I've heard people say this that I work with and I've been like, oh my gosh, yeah. So it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. So we have a, a question from one of my students who asks, you mentioned the desire to do work that is life affirming, to disrupt the myth of the neutrality of the museum. Can you please say more about what you mean by life affirming work? Thanks. Yeah, you know, I was just trying to find ways that the the problems that I was I experienced and the stuff I didn't I didn't expect it to be so bad sometimes I'd be like oh my gosh like it was good in some ways and then some some stuff was just so bad like I found myself at one meeting that I would go to it regularly and I would sit automatically like hunched up in a ball and I didn't realize I was doing that until someone asked me they said are you all right is your stomach bothering you or something and I was like what no I'm fine and they they were like why are you sitting like that and I was like 
oh, am I sitting like this? And then I realized I did it all the time at this one meeting. And it was my body was responding to what was going to happen because that meeting was always pretty violent. And I was sitting there and just felt like I couldn't, you know, it wasn't welcome for me to speak against it. And also it was just like 200 other people who aren't going to say anything. So I'm just going to be the one who seems like the problem person, right? I could either just keep taking that. And if it feels horrible, like literally in your body to keep taking this, it makes people get stressed out and just feel gross. And you know, some people just leave in addition to like just overtly problematic stuff people are saying, but just the, re the, way, you, the way I was taking it in my body was really hurting. So yeah, I just started to try to find things that felt like, that don't feel like they're killing me. That don't feel like they're harming me. Cause a lot of things feel like harm you know, and whatever I could do to try to not be in those situations, I was working hard to do it. And it sometimes meant really very careful, like literally curating who I was going to be talking to, who I would work with. And so the exciting part is um, doing any little, uh, as I say little, as a curatorial fellow, I'm not, I didn't really have that much power, but when I could do a project, an exhibition, all of a sudden, this is now I've got some power and, and not a lot. And still, you know, there's a lot of other people that are part of the whole project. Um, but with the power that I had, the sanction power I had, I was gonna try to create a community that felt good by who I was gonna bring into the space. And that's part of what I mean by life affirming there. Um, doing these other things like the art of black descent, that felt life affirming. It didn't, it was hard and originally I didn't even understand that I was gonna love that project. But when I started doing it, especially getting out into community spaces and having Oh, like an elder um, this man that was in his like 70s or 80s or something. And he said that, you know, he was a young person back in the 60s. And he felt that over these years that just nobody really seems to care about what happened then and so much stuff in the community and just a lot of the same problems that we're dealing with today. And he just really feels like a lot of people don't care or don't get it. And he said the, that through doing the, the program, that one where we put up art and talk to people in the library and stuff, he said that that program felt like a balm, like a B-A-L-M. And I didn't understand what he meant at first. I was like, what? And he started touching his hand like lotion or something. He said, it felt like a balm. Um, it was like something that just felt like an embrace. And when he said that, I almost cried. Like it just made me realize that I was doing something that actually was important to people, not just for education, but like spiritually we're connecting with people and um, not just empowering, giving them political knowledge, but we're connecting with people on this other level. And that, that felt life affirming. I hope that kind of gets at it. All right. Well, I apologize to everyone that this was a kind of brief uh, Q&A, but um, in the interest of respecting LaTanya's time and all of your time, um, I think that will take us to the end of our program tonight. So on behalf of the Sheldon, thank you so, so much, LaTanya. Thank you to Ellery and her wonderful students. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us on a Wednesday night. Um, so if you enjoyed this program, we do encourage you um, to donate to the Stuart Swift Research Center to, to um, allow us to do more free programming like this. Um, but we're so appreciative of your attendance and enthusiasm and wonderful questions. Um, and we hope you all have a fabulous Wednesday night. So with that, good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Latanya. Thank you.